Welcome to Gather Geeks, a podcast by BizBash, the place where people passionate about meetings and events come together. This episode is a Gather Geeks special sponsor edition. Here's your host, BizBash chairman and founder, David Adler. Our guest today is Joe Schwinger. He's the co-founder and CEO of Meeting Play, a virtual and hybrid event platform. His company powers some of the largest virtual events in the world of hospitality and technology and other sectors, and his clients include Marriott and Slack and PepsiCo and Bristol-Myers Squibb and many, many more. He's been an innovator who was an early player in virtual and who in this accelerated COVID pivoting world is one of the most experienced in the business. As this year's guest producer of BizBash National Event Awards, he's going to give us a preview of what to expect. And in this brave new virtual and hybrid world, we're going to find out why things like gamifying your swag store is such an important part of your success in grabbing people's attention. He's going to outline why content on virtual events uh, is so much more important now and that organizers turn to analytics to find out what people really want to go to, which they can't do in face-to-face. He's also going to give us some great arguments for returning to face-to-face events. So let's take a listen. Joe, welcome to Gather Geeks. Thank you for having me. I think that uh, we've been partners and friends for a long time, and we're so excited that you are going to be taking over our BizBash Event Style Awards in a virtual format this year. Yeah, And we understand that you are really going all out and making and reinventing the award shows. And so yeah. I'd l- love to hear a little bit about what your plans are for February 17th at 1 p.m. Eastern time and 10 p.m. Pacific time. When we looked at the awards and you looked at the, the background and the celebration of the great things that the event industry has done and the celebration It brought us back to where we were in March of 2020 when COVID hit and everybody had to figure it out. The approach that we wanted to take was look at all the great things that happened and what if we took the award winners and turned them into case studies for everyone. So when we looked at it, we said, hey, this is a celebration. What if we also turn it into education and give back to the community so that their events can benefit from the award winners and their stories and maybe the pitfalls that they made other people won't make those mistakes and getting invited or winning an award is a great achievement we looked at how do we bring some entertainment to the table and really think about it as an award uh, ceremony when i'm watching the oscars or anything else there's always a little bit of entertainment mixed in so the combination of a celebration of our peers combined with education, and then bringing in a flavor of excitement and entertainment, I think is really going to hit us up for success. It's interesting that you say that because we're really at a point where I've seen so much innovation that's been happening this year in all fronts. And so the idea of giving it over to you as guest producers in many cases is very cool as a partnership approach. Because the one thing I think we all learn from everybody is nobody knows anything and that when we work together, magic can happen. Yeah. And we also make mistakes along the way that we iterate all the time. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that the, if we did this process probably in that last March, it would be a lot different than doing it this um, January. Yeah, I would say so. We recently were a part of a rollout strategy for Marriott for hybrid. And I remember when Doreen was on stage addressing the virtual as well as the in-person crowd She said, listen, we're going to make mistakes today, and that might be not bad. As everyone knows, we're charting this as we move along. And making mistakes and your recovery and moving in the right direction after you make a mistake, that's what all this is about. Figuring it out and charting the right course is definitely the way that meeting play strives. And certainly, we all learn from our mistakes and I could definitely give you some doozies, David, of some mistakes we've made in the last eight years. I am interested in hearing some of those, but I would like to first see what do you have in mind for the broad run of show? 
Like, why is, what do you do? How do, what is the first thing you do in a virtual award program today? And how do you deal with people's attention spans and, and how do you make a case study interesting? Yeah, I think the good, so the good thing that we have on our side is that if there's anything that I know about the event industry is we're really sponges, right? It's a competitive advantage. Who wouldn't want free nuggets of information that you can bring to your next client and be successful. And really that's the thrill, I think, of what is in front of us is, hey, here's the top talent in the event industry across all of these categories. And we've taken, I don't know if it's eight or 10 or what the number is. So it's very hard though, to do a virtual event for event planners because <laughs> it, it is like the pressure is on. We feel it every single day. Yeah. So we're watching an award show within a award presentation envelope that is being judged as harshly or as liberally as the people that are winning and losing in a sense, in terms of getting, no one's really losing, but that are, that are not getting the, the top nod. How do you see the sort of the opening of, of, a, of an award program like this? What's that first thing that somebody's going to see? And as we know, it all comes down to the Maya Angelou quote, what are we going to make them feel when yeah. they get in? And how do you do it? Through this lens that we got this, I'm looking at you now uh, through a through a screen, yeah. and I see your face and I see how you're reacting and things like that. How do you? What is your advice to everyone as someone that's been doing this now for eight years and for this eight nine month period of intensity yeah. to to break through the screen? Yeah, that's a good question, David. And I guess what I would go back to is two core deliverables on everything that meeting play does. And the first is the, the first plays off the second, which is you have to understand the attendee and the goals of what you're trying to accomplish and then critique the environment. So the venue, what do we love about the Oscars or any of those major awards? It's the red carpet and it's the arrival experience and it's walking into that venue and seeing the theater. And then the second thing is, first impressions, right? So if you set the tone via the venue by the look and feel and the polish and the arrival experience and showing them the benefits of sticking around, but create that excitement with the venue, I think that we're gonna hit a home run. David, I'll tell you, there's nothing more scary than being the venue for meeting planners than being the technology venue for developers for a tech conference. So it, it's, oh, yeah. we've, been, Same thing. <laughs> we've been thrown into this kind of unique environment where our technology is driving the experience for our peers, not just meeting planners, but because we do 50,000 person tech conferences, every one of every individual, 50,000 of them is judging the technology that they're using. But I go back to understanding the attendee and the goal of what we're trying to accomplish and critiquing the environment, which is really what I think meeting play excels at, is, is going to be key. Make them feel that they've entered the venue for the awards and the education. Since this is radio, walk us through what that looks like when someone comes into a tech conference or walks into what could be the BizBash award program, what is that? Wow. We talk about technology, but we're all still engaged by the feast of the eyes, especially here. Yeah. What are you trying to show? And what have you learned about what kind of works in that first impression? I mean, yeah. the first impression at a technology event is no different than a first impression at anything. Absolutely. It actually, when we started working with a great team over at BizBash and we started to lay out even the voting mechanism for the People's Choice Awards, we were provided some graphics that we could work around. And obviously we start with a base, but knowing the, the detail orientation of the people that are doing the voting, we decided that we were in, we, so we selected this image of a beautiful table with candles on it and a chandelier above it. We decided that we were going to add some shimmer to the chandelier so it looked like it was moving and twinkling. As you talk about producing for our peers and the extreme detail orientation of meeting planners and anybody in the event industry, 
my hope is that's the kind of twinkle that they'll pick up on and say, wow, they made that chandelier twinkle like I'm walking into a small setting a table. And then in the technology realm, you have to play to the strengths of the attendees and the technology that they, that they work in. So we work with a software company that's very heavily focused in construction. The environment is very heavy on cool factor, but around construction. There's another company that we work with, actually Kong, out of the Valley. They work on really high-tech APIs. Well, their virtual environment was dark stars and really played to, if you think about a really big techie, all of those things they really gravitate towards were built in that virtual environment to set the tone for that conference. And then as they peel back the onion of all the features and everything else, the beauty is keeping that consistent across the board. It's not just the first impression, because if there's anything that we all know about attendee engagement, it's, well, we can hit a home run within the first hour of the conference, but what happens on day three or day two? You've got to keep their attention across the whole conference not just the beginning of the conference. So what are your rules about this? What's the play, meeting play playbook? Yeah, this is where I always talk to a customer and it's, listen, you're going to get 80% of the way there, but we're going to be your 20%. And that's when we come to the table with kind of a toolbox of engagement tools that we're able to really critique around the customer and the attendee journey that we're trying to work around. Let me give you a case study. There's a high tech customer that was doing training and then they were doing a lot of, they were doing three days of actual content, but two days of training. So five days in total, which is a a tremendous amount of time to hold engagement. There we used gamification. That was the glue that really kept them excited on day five and coming back and interacting with the content. And it wasn't just gamification it was gamification on steroids. So we attached a swag store to it so that there was really the opportunity for everybody to win something. It wasn't an all or nothing. And again, that really goes back to understanding your attendee, what your goals are. The goal was five days of engagement, not just two. And using the 20% that we bring to the table with our toolbox to hit on all cylinders for them. So the swag box, the swag tool is something built into your system? Yeah, yeah, we do that for quite a bit of our customers and- Break that out into English. What is the, (laughs) for the people that are, who need to see it, what does that look like? Yeah, so traditional gamification, whether it be a mobile app or virtual platform is you entice them to do things and get points. And one of the problems, or I would say negatives with uh, gamification is that Most of the time you'll have a group of people that are really interested and they rise to the top of the leaderboard and then it becomes unattainable for other people to catch up with them. So you've really created an environment where 5% of the attendees are engaged and there's 95% that are not. What the swag store has allowed us to do is remove those boundaries. So instead we have a conversion of those points into dollars. And then you use those digital currency dollars to buy things within a swag store. So you've removed this boundary of an all or nothing situation. And instead you've made it that everybody has an opportunity to earn points, convert them to digital currency, and then go into the swag store and quote unquote, buy things digitally that was tangible. And are there things in the, are there any rules for the swag that makes people want to buy them? Are you promoting that up front or are you just, they go to the swag store? Like how do you build up anticipation for what's in there? Yeah. So there's definitely, there's definitely anticipation and a lot of work that we do. David, when was the last time you went to a trade show at this point? Was it a year ago? Oh my God. I think it was in December. Yeah. For me, It was January. I went to a, actually I was at CES. What's the best part of going to a trade show? Walking around to the booths and getting swag 
and yeah. getting all that stuff. So, or, or food. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, if you can figure out a way for us to do food virtually, now we've got something. Think about it. Swag and product is it, it's connected right to this environment. So when we're when we announce that there's a swag store, everybody's like, "Whoa, wait a minute. Okay, this is something that I haven't seen that I'm used to." And it, it has a real cool factor to it. So there's a little bit of education, but what we find pretty much across the board, you don't need much because people just love the notion of that kind of walking around the trade show and getting the swag. And so that, what, what are the other things in the toolbox uh, for engagement that you have found are the top two or three? Yeah, probably outside of gamification, which is certainly one of the top three, I would say also within the top three, and we work very hard at this at meeting play is around lifting the face-to-face experience of the face-to-face meetings, right? When we were back on property into the virtual environment. And with us, it's not just like a one thing, right? We've weaved this through the DNA of the virtual environment. And that is bringing people Face to face. And let me give you some examples. So we have a networking algorithm that will take those 50,000 people at a conference and give you the 20 or the 50 that you should be talking to. But we don't encourage you to talk. Well, we encourage you to talk, but we encourage you to do face to face, right? Go into the networking room and see each other and have a much more powerful conversation. As we all know, right, there's just so much more when you can see somebody's facial expressions and you could see them. And that's what we've been working really hard uh, to bring to the virtual environment. And it's not just one-on-one, okay? Another part of events and conferences was at the end of the day, having a roundtable discussion, which could be lost if you don't do it correctly within a virtual environment. And native to our platform is putting people into these networking or these roundtables and getting them interacting with each other. But also, I would say doing so in a very respectable way. There are people that don't want to be on camera, but they want to chat. Well, you need to give them choice. To go back to your question, excuse me, bringing as much of the face-to-face interactions has been a really rewarding but also a very popular tactic in our engagement platform that we've been deploying across our virtual conferences. Let me ask you a couple of deeper questions on that. On the engage- I believe that I, I totally agree that the engagement piece is the most important. From a philosophical point of view, are you curating the engagement or are you letting the engagement happen? How do you encourage people? How you go to the you go to the high school, junior high school dance and you get the boys to dance with the girls? How do you do it? <laughs> Yeah, it's a little bit of both, actually. I don't think that from what what we've seen over the last 10 months is the more you can allow the attendees to write their journey and sometimes not write the journey for them, the more successful you will be. So we do it both ways. So naturally, we're typically working for an organization that has goals and what they are trying to accomplish. So when you go through the networking algorithm, You may be asked to join a roundtable discussion about their product X, or what does the future look like in event technology? Because they're looking to have a focus group to bring the answers of that focus group to their products. But then you also have a subset of people. Anytime you do a sales and marketing, then, you know, we're social, but everybody is a social butterfly and event uh, world. Those two segments really gravitate towards hey, in the networking hour, I want to bounce around into different rooms and talk to as many people as possible. And that would be an example of kind of allowing them to create their own journey instead of writing the journey uh, for them. And I would tell you that it's about 50-50 where we hear from people. It's really split down the center. There's so much opportunity, tell me where I need to go versus let me discover. And actually, David, I would say that word discover is probably another one of those top tools that the virtual environment brings to the table through engagement. When you're on property, 
and you leave the keynote and there's five breakouts, you're set on going to one of those breakouts and there's no record later that you could watch the four that you missed. Utilizing the discovery comp component of our platform, you almost get to see more relevant, it, it's Netflix, right? If I like this segment of the market, you might like this. One of the questions that we typically get is, what's the right amount of live content, okay? But what we tell people is if you do your, if, if we do our job as a platform, you could double the viewership of what you think is right. And the discovery component of it plays a big role. Let me go back to our, the tech conferences that we do. 250 breakouts. There's no way that I could see all of that. But if I'm gonna get 10 breakouts that I'm gonna go to, and you could tell me the ones that are most relevant to me, what have I done? I have totally increased the attendee satisfaction and become more loyal to the organization that I went to that virtual environment for. And do you, but do you think that, yeah, I can see you have all the technology, but there's still a lot of onus that's going to be put on the content people to make sure the content's better than ever in a virtual environment. So you can't do it alone. They can't just hire a technology platform and, and all of a sudden their event's gonna get better. So how do you teach them that content is so much more important now? I, I used to go to, to events. No one would ever care what I said on the stage or in my breakout room. Now yeah. you got to be careful about that. So David, when I am on the phone with a potential client, the first question, what are the goals of what we're trying to accomplish? The second statement is how strong is your production arm? How strong is the content team behind these goals? And what we have found and what you really are alluding to is we can create the most amazing environment that they've ever seen. We can create the most engaging tools that they've ever used. But it's like at the end of the day, it's like turning on the TV and trying a show that you've never seen before. Five minutes in, they will decide whether they're gonna watch the rest of the show or they're gonna move on. And if there's anything that I would say about the environment that we're in, it's that attention spans are shorter and people are more snappy with moving along than they've ever been. If you can't capture them, and this is the content, if you can't capture them, you've lost them. And here's the beauty of the virtual environments is now we have all the data to show that. In, a, in the keynote, if five people left or 50 people left, we may not know. But in the virtual environment, we know how sticky the content is because we have true analytics to show the duration in which people are watching your content. Have you, ha have you found any common denominators among what works in terms of content today? Yeah, I would say there are a couple key things that stick out. One of our clients, Slack, they produced the most beautiful captivating keynotes that I've seen in a very long time. To their credit, I, I remember seeing a comment on Twitter saying, wow, Slack is giving Apple a run for their money on the keynotes. So what they were doing there was they were creating a very highly produced environment to energize the content and to keep the users really guessing what's next through the production value. So there, I would say the key learning is think about your production budgets and what you can bring to the table. And I always love the keep them wondering what's next, okay? And that's where the production company will bring something to the table. So give me an example of what the, they do. Did they have celebrities? Did they have themes? Did they, like what kind of keynotes were they? Yeah, so what, what they did was they moved around their the, it, different environments and they did so using very Slack terminology to keep you on your toes. So the executives were constantly moving, but they were moving into different environments and it created a where are we going next uh, world. And then the second point that I was going to make, David, on the content that I think works really well 
is bringing a sense of authentic people to the table, right? Probably the one key thing that we love hearing is, wow, I, I saw the CEO of a multi-billion dollar company in his home. And it's okay if there's kids behind and, and things are going on. It's we're bringing off authentic user experience to the table. And what we always encourage, which will totally keep people gravitated to the content, is to bring a connection of the virtual audience and the people on screen. Now, here's what I mean by that is, so one of our engagement tools is the capabilities of asking a question, but having other people vote on that question, right? So now the person that's giving this presentation sees 50 people want to know the pressing question. The moment that you actually answer that question and say, oh, it looks like 50 of you want to know the answer to this question. What you've done is you've created a connection of kind of the virtual space, right? Like the guy in the cloud to the people that are actually watching. Yeah, and no, there's that's, this- that's brilliant. Yeah. I, I remember we used that at some, one of our webinars that we've done with you. And it was from a moderator point of view, it was a game changer. Yes, absolutely. So the, the more you can connect the two worlds together, you are creating in some respects, I actually, in a call that I had previous to this, I was asked the pros and cons of face-to-face -face versus virtual. And one of the things that I said is a pro in the virtual environment is my, there are peers at meeting play that would never raise their hand in a ballroom of 5,000 people to ask a question. And in the virtual environment, you're giving that person a voice because they don't have to raise their hand in front of 5,000 people. They can do so on a virtual platform and they've done something that they would not have done in a face-to-face -face environment, but it lifts the tides for everybody. So do you think, based on what you just said, going down a little different track here, do you think that the hybrid event is going to be the audience listening, to, having the hybrid uh, sort of platform and being in the hybrid while they're in the real room, like they're watching sports and things? Hybrid is, uh, I really hate when people keep on saying this, but obviously hybrid is the next phase of this. But I, I think there's no way around it. If you're not thinking about hybrid, you're thinking blockbuster to Netflix. So we were very fortunate in that we rolled out our hybrid strategy with Marriott in November of last year. And it was very successful on all kinds of, all kinds of uh, metrics. But the one key thing that we did was the virtual audience, they had a voice with somebody on property. So there were hundreds of people virtually and there were X number of people on property, but there was one moderator that was the voice of the virtual attendees. And that was the connection of the people that were watching virtually versus the people that were on stage answering questions and providing the content. The virtual folks felt like they had a voice through this one individual. And that was, that really made, I think it was about six hours of content go by in like the snap of a wrist. It felt like it was only 30 seconds. I heard the term that, that in hybrid, we're gonna be having to break the fifth wall. And the fifth wall is how do you integrate the attendees, live attendees with the online attendees. And the suggestion was you walk into an event and I'm sure you'll come up with a better way of thinking about this. And you see a bunch of iPads on a wall and you can actually take a buddy with you <laughs> on the journey. So there, I think there's so much potential for what's gonna happen. You also, I also learned that you don't wanna duplicate in the hybrid everything. Yes. That, is that what you've learned too? That, that you have to be much more, you must edit? Yeah, I want to go to both of those things that you had just mentioned. I will say that most of the hybrid events that we're in the middle of planning or, or ones that are coming up, there's definitely a, a notion of everything that you get on property. So three days of content may not be three days of content in a, high, in, in a virtual environment. A, the cost is very high to do. And as we all know, keeping the attention of somebody virtually is almost impossible for 10 hours a day over three days. So we are seeing that the virtual environment will have shorter 
content. But I want to go back to actually the, the first, what you talked about, right? The how do you merge the two worlds together in the fifth dimension? I, I, I really think that this is the, the, the next evolution of where a then technology will have to flip itself on its head. And naturally, we have a vision that we're executing. And it's through our ambassador program. And that is where you will have subject matter experts on property that are live streaming, that are the subject matter experts that are walking around this environment. And we give them an audience virtually. I always relate this to this service called, which there's 20 people that are watching somebody else play a video game. It's, it's amazing. If you're passionate about a product, you love to research that product and see different dimensions of what other people think about it. So what we're deploying is organizations having subject matter experts that work for the company, that will be those ambassadors, but we're also allowing the attendees on property to be those ambassadors as well. If I'm talking about a product that was really multidimensional and I wanna know about one segment of it, I can subscribe to that channel and watch things unfold on property through the eyes of other peers that are there. That, that brings up another point about the whole philosophy of events in general. And that is, and it sounds like what you're doing is personalization yeah, and narrow casting as opposed to broadcasting. And it's getting even more narrow. Yes. Is that yeah. a fair statement? Is that? Uh... Yeah, I, I think it, it's definitely a fair statement. And what had, what, and the reason why is that everyone has been very spoiled in a virtual environment for what you said, the personalization. And that's why I, I say like, you say the fifth wall, this is the next dimension of it, right? We as a global audience now are comfortable in this new tech environment. How do we capitalize on that when we go back on property? We started out saying, how do you make somebody feel something through the screen? why one of the myths that I see happening is some of these CEOs of major companies are going to say, we've been doing it virtually. Why do we need to do face-to-face? -face? And we're creating solutions, but they're still not quite there yet. How, what is the answer to, to that CEO that says, we've been doing it this way virtually. Why don't we just not do the face-to-face -face events anymore? I have a little bit of a different perspective. I was hoping that, I, that's what I want. I, yeah. we, we're looking for arguments. We're yeah. not, I'm, I'm trying to give us ammunition for everyone listening to yeah. say, yeah. forget that, bud. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what I always tell people, because again, we work on events of 50,000, 70,000 people globally, but what, and, and that is what the CMO and the CEO are saying. Why would I go back to a thousand people when I can have 70,000 people? here's one, mm -hmm. one of the answers to that. And what I tell people deals happen face to face, right? So if you look at the, there's a segment of the market, we're all planning meetings for people to get together for deals to happen. If you look at one of our tech customers and they had 50,000 people at their virtual event, having the deal making part of it, was still a little old fashioned in terms of picking up the phone. That's going to, that's going to happen on property, right? You have to have people together in a room for that to happen. Looking at the trade show environment, probably one of the hardest things that we've had to work around in the virtual environment is how do you successfully do a trade show? I see that environment going a little bit back naturally on property. And again, it's about deals actually happening, but David, there is no, if you look at the cost per attendee virtually compared to the cost per attendee on property, this is the argument, right? From the CEO and the chief financial officer, but the chief sales officer is saying, I want my decision makers on property. So I think that's where it's gonna start and we'll see I, certainly nobody is saying this is the way that it's going to be, but that's what I'm thinking. I also think that someone said to me that events are the ultimate high touch solution. And that if you need a high touch, which 
most, depending on the cost of a good or service that you're selling or an idea, the high touch or the high emotion is still going to be face to face. Yeah. And integrate it. And, and do, do these uh, virtual environments create the FOMO to bring face to face in the next time? Yeah. Is, do you, yeah. Or how and do you I argue would, that? Or is it, and, and as the guy that's trying to create the venue, I can certainly tell you that there have, and all of us would agree, we have all had experiences on property that you simply just cannot create in a virtual environment. Certainly, we're about to write that chapter. Some of us are writing it already and learning as we had talked about, but I'm, I'm pretty bullish on the face-to-face -face aspect. And, but as we all know, it will be different because we have learned uh, so much in the last 10 months. So let's end with, we've been going on a while. This has been fascinating to me totally. Put your crystal ball, let's do your crystal ball. Like what development projects or what's in your pipeline that's your like coolest thing that you want to develop and that um, you've learned about it through this experience in the last 10 months? What we have learned is that we can take a good segment of the people outside of their comfort zone related to technology. And what we are doing and what all of us have been doing over the last couple of months is how do we exploit that for the benefit of everybody. So the pipeline at uh, Meeting Play, outside of hybrid, in conjunction with hybrid, is really true to the way the company was founded eight years ago. And when we went to the market 10 months ago, it's about the face-to-face -face engagement between all of the attendees. So where we're really focusing a lot of our efforts is certainly around the content, but more about the user to user interactions, okay? And bringing more tools to the table to replicate face-to-face, -face, but do so in a genuinely innovative way that's never been seen before. Just so you know, David, I'm a, I'm a product guy, right? Like I love creation like anybody else. I've never been more excited about the next six months than I have since I started my career 25 years ago. So lots of fun times in front of us. Great. So why don't we, for other people that want to have the Slack experience and the Marriott experience and all these cool companies that you're serving, how do they get in touch with you and learn more about uh, what you're doing? Hey, the best thing that we love at Meeting Play is what we're doing right now, education and really just talking to people. So what I would actually say for anybody listening is drop an email to hello at meetingplay.com. And I might just be the person to reply and get on the phone and talk about, hey, not what meeting play can do for you, but what are your goals? And can I steer you in the right direction? Although we've been very successful, again, part of the best part about the last 10 months is really educating our peers and going at this together and uncovering all those nuggets. So drop us an email at hello at meetingplay.com, say hi. And let's have some coffee together. Fantastic. And everybody should tune in on Wednesday, February 17th at 1 p.m. Eastern and 10 p.m. Pacific or figure it out around the world because we have people everywhere. And Meeting Play's virtual platform will be where you will find the BizBash Awards for 2020. And so we're so excited to have partners like you helping us reinvent the future or inventing the future really at this point. We don't know, nobody knows anything anymore. And so we're looking at this experimentation and help so you don't have to actually. Right. So thanks guys. Any final comments, Joe? Everybody stay healthy first and then we'll see each other real soon. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you like what you're hearing, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. We can be found on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Player FM, Google Play, and Pocket Cast. Be sure to leave us a rating and review. It helps others discover the Gather Geeks podcast. We'd also love to hear from you. You can leave feedback on Twitter at Gather Geeks or leave us an email, gathergeeks at bizbash.com. We hope you join us again for the next episode of Gather Geeks. Until then, gather on.